This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. Joined today by Patrick Newman, who is a uh, one-time summer fellow here at the Mises Institute. He's back with us this summer, and he's actually editing and working on a new book by Murray Rothbard. And one of the interesting things about Murray Rothbard is he's still writing books <laughs> 20 odd years after his death. And, yeah. and of course, that's made possible by the fact that we have these extensive archives here of Murray's stuff, physical stuff that was taken from his apartment in New York and also his place in Las Vegas when he died. So we, we literally have volumes of material that Murray wrote, uh, notes from him, uh, stuff that's still coming out last year. Uh, with the help of Justin Ramondo, we published Murray's book called Never a Dull Moment on the 60s. So now we are set to publish in 2017 a new book by Murray Rothbard on the progressive era. And Patrick has the uh, tough but fun task of <laughs> editing that book. So uh, welcome to Mises Weekends. And, and uh, talk to us a little bit about how this book project came to be. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. And this book project... This was a book that Rothbard, the progressive era is one of the areas of United States economic history Rothbard had spent a, a long time on. And he actually started working on this book while he was involved with the Cato Institute in the late 70s. And he okay. was commissioned to write a book on the progressive era. And what happened is it was sort of linked in, involved in with his, his split with the Cato Institute. The book never got formally finished. He wrote about nine chapters of material. But he ended up finishing the book in the 80s really by writing essays on uh, events that he wanted to later talk about, such as the welfare state, the progressive era in the family, the Federal Reserve, World War I, et cetera. And so those essays were published, but the actual manuscript uh, really went from about the 1860s to Theodore Roosevelt's administration. That never got published. So I was working on, I was involved in the Rothbard archives. I uh, was involved in uh, actually editing an unpublished uh, chapter of Man, Economy, and State and sort of linked in with sort of finding things was the, some chapters on the progressive era. And as an economic historian myself, this is a period I was very interested in. I was very interested in Rothbard's uh, work and his, his lectures on the topic. So really just started to go from there, really collect the chapters, edit them from there, type them up. Yeah. And uh, here we are. <laughs> well, uh, an unpublished chapter of Man, Economy, and State, that's something I'd be interested in reading for sure. But <laughs> yeah. So what's so interesting to me is looking over just, just Murray's introduction to this book, the progressive era is usually sold to us as this benign period of modernization. And, of course, Murray sees it very differently as this as this huge cultural and, and political leap from the relatively laissez-faire 19th century to this welfare, warfare, big government 20th century. So it's really a sea change, and it's, and it's bound up in things like World War One and the income tax and central banking. Yeah. Yeah. For most intellectuals and really for, you know, most people they learn in high school is that, okay, you had the Gilded Age, you had the Industrial Revolution. Yes, it brought advances, but it brought monopolies, it brought deflation, mm -hmm. rampant business cycles, economic inequality, et cetera. And so this is progressive is the time when the federal government said, okay, we have to be more involved. Laissez-faire doesn't work. It might have worked for the agrarian economy of the Jeffersonians, et cetera. But now this is when we have to let the intellectuals and planners, we have to have, you know, steer, you know, guide the economy. And, and Rothbard had a slightly different assessment <laughs> of the era. And for him, it was really a change, a sea change in ideology among business, government, citizens, and the intellectuals away from liberty towards power, towards central planning. And, and in his introduction, he's really looking at this as some kind of unholy business intellectual alliance, right, where yeah. we're going to have – and a lot of it goes to scientism, right, mm -hmm. that we're going to have this new cadre of supposedly scientific public intellectuals guiding us, <laughs> yeah. and, and that's some, something we didn't enjoy in the 19th century. Yes. So one theme, aside from in all of his Rothbard's historical work, aside from the theme of, say, liberty versus power, Rothbard always would mention on the idea of the alliance of throne and altar. So in order to get the public really to adhere towards the state's sort of depredations or interventions, you have to have some form of 
intellectual class to tell him that this is good. So originally it was the altar. It was the priests, the clergymen. They said, you have to listen to the king. The, ki- the king is divine. He's holy. Mm-hmm. He'll save you, etc. And what happened, though, is after that, it became, especially in the early 20th century, it became intellectual. So they say the this, this high taxes, the spending, these interventions are good because they're good for the public welfare. So Rothbard calls them the court intellectuals, basically. And they're out for, you know, one of their special interests is that, well, they get the prestige of planning, administering the system. Uh, they get they get power associated with, linked with the whole university and research apparatus. But it's definitely, the intellectuals are definitely a big part uh, of the era, as well as Rothbard's analysis. Well, and there's so many analogies today when you look at the at, at what a Bill Crystal uh, talks about as this as a, probably we would call him a pseudo intellectual, but mm-hmm. but in terms of uh, the unholy relationship between um, a lot of the Beltway think tanks and defense contractors would be one right, obvious yeah. example. Now, two things that come out of this progressive era that Murray writes about are, of course, uh, compulsory public schooling, which was viewed as a laudatory advancement. And labor unions, which are also seen as a progressive um, mm-hmm. achievement, but but um, Murray talks about them as a way to sort of corral and mainstream immigrants, and he, he yeah. argues that they that uh, um, labor unions had racist origins. Yeah, yeah. So one of sort of related to this alliance with Throne and Altar was you could say this new Rothbard calls it the Quadripartite Alliance of basically four groups: big business. They wanted to use the government to cartelize. You had big government. They wanted to enhance their own power. You had big unions who were there mainly to stifle sort of the radical Marxist uh, so- socialist you know, mm-hmm. labor elements. And then you had big intellectuals who were really out to sort of plan the system and, and get the prestige. So one of you – know, definitely part of Rothbard's analysis and Rothbard talks about this really, the National Civic Federation, basically an, an organization – that combined all those elements, getting sort of labor involved and using them. One of the ways is big business had no problem with trying to get other businesses to adopt (laughs) labor unions, but many of those leaders themselves wouldn't want to adopt them for themselves, for their own businesses. Hmm. Uh, So it's it's definitely part of it. Uh, Public schooling is another huge issue. And Rothbard talks about this. It's really a, a link because he spends a lot of time in the late 1900s, uh, late, excuse me, late 1800s on this, he talks about many of these religious interventionists, these pietists wanted to impose public schooling in the sense that uh, the way it was called is Christianizing the Catholics. The Catholics were sort of unruly. They were sinful. They held the Roman popery. So you need to have, you know, the, you need to have a new system of public schools basically to, to get the kids while they're young. And over time, that became more secularized in which it just – you need to sort of indoctrinate the, the, the students to you know, adhere to a big government, a big state, et cetera. It's, it's all involved. Yeah, it's all, it's all linked. Yeah. Well, no, I, I really enjoy this, uh, this theme that Murray has. And it's uh, it, it's also mirrored in his four-volume history of colonial America. But that uh, there, there's sort of a status – wasp Protestant yeah. plot <laughs> that comes out of the New England portion yeah. of early America and that uh, you've got these controlling puritanical impulses yeah. uh, that are that are illibertarian mm-hmm. fundamentally and, and these contrast with the more freewheeling Catholics who are who are more willing to drink alcohol and as a result of this uh, um, puritanical impulse we get some progressive things like prohibition yeah exactly and one of the Rothbard, uh, in one of his class lectures, he mentioned a quote from H.L. Mencken. He said, Puritism is the haunting fear that somewhere someone might be having fun. <laughs> so it's it's all linked where from the Puritans in New England, you move to upstate New York or in the Midwest, and you get this group of Yankee post-millennial pietists who believe that basically you have to create a kingdom of God on earth for a thousand years before Jesus can return. And to do so, you not only have to save yourself, you have to save others. And that leads to correcting sins such as prohibition, uh, Sunday blue laws, uh, restricting immigration, you know, all these sorts of local interventions that in turn led to greater um, interventions on the state level. Because if you have to have the government to support 
interventions on the local level, you also have to have them support interventions you know, on the, on the state level. So there is a big drive. Many of these progressive reformers were pietists, and over time they became secularized, but they still never lost their burning zeal, basically, to remake the world, um, you know, to, to enhance the world through their own design. So it seems like whether we've got throne or altar or yeah. public intellectuals, we yeah. have we've always got statism in the mix somehow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, now talk about whether this book is more of a historical book or is it more commentary on the progressive era? Is it, is it a mixture of both? Uh, it's it's really a mixture of both. I think it combines sort of Rothbard was known. You know, he had he, he was involved in many eras: economics, history, economic history, political science. It really combines a lot of those. So, it's it's a history book, but you know, Rothbard is sure to also provide his commentary on it. You have some sections that are you know very economic, such as on the merger movement and how many of those mergers failed. Then you really have three chapters that are very in depth in political science. He's going really into various local elections state elections, et cetera, and the third party system. And then, you know, afterwards he has the historical analysis of, of government during this time. It's really kind of a combination of all of those. Yeah. You know, some of Rothbard's critics don't like that he wrote so much outside of economics mm -hmm. per yeah. se. And and some of Rothbard's fans love that he wrote so much other than yeah. economics. Yeah. Um, you know, where do you think this book will sit in in terms of uh, his other output? Is this is this a, a, a breezy fun book, or does it have more of an academic feel to it? Well, I think with a lot of Rothbard's works, depending on how you read it, it can be both. Uh, Rothbard has the knack that in many of his writings, it can be something that's easily read, you know, by a layman, but it can also be something that can be read much more in depth by an academic. I think it does have just partially due to its size and some of its material. It might be some of, you know, more academic book, but at the same time, it also has a, you know, can be very read by the layman one because it's on a topic that's interesting. Uh, you know, it sort of relates to, because it explains, you know, the emergence of the modern state. And just in terms of Rothbard's language, how he writes things, it's very uh, digestible. So, for example, America's Great Depression can be read by both sort of the, mm -hmm. the layman, but it can also be, and it's something that I repeatedly use as sort of a research book in order to, you know, because he has tons, he has a lot of insights in that book. So I think with a lot of his work, it, it, it's both. Yeah. Does he get into some of the political figures of the era? I'd love to hear him skewering Roosevelt or Taft or Woodrow Wilson or William Jennings Bryan, yeah. uh, the, you know, sort of the Babbitts of, of that time. Yeah. So he, he goes through the, he, he goes through them, uh, many of the political figures during that time period. So he goes through Grover Cleveland, William McKinley, William Jennings Bryant. Uh, he goes through Theodore Roosevelt. He's got two chapters on, on Theodore Roosevelt, uh, at least ex exclusively on, uh, on him. And yeah, so at least with Bryan, he has, he doesn't, he doesn't view Bryan highly because he was, in a sense, the main figure who, sort of dismantled the Democratic Party. One of Rothbard's explanations for why you had the progressive era was the, you, you had the basically dismantling of sort of the laissez-faire bourbon Democrats, sort of the populist Democrats basically took over the, uh, the, the party. And so William Jennings Bryant, and this was a big change for the Democrats, he was sort of a pietist mm -hmm. uh, crusader. And so this alienated a lot of the former Democrats who were attracted to the party uh, and then made them sort of switch to the Republicans. Conveniently, William McKinley sort of moderated his stance around this time period. Theodore Roosevelt uh, is, 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 is not looked upon highly by Rothbard as well. Uh, one thing that Rothbard was known to do and one of his most interesting sort of um, – historical you know, analyses that sort of permeate throughout his work as he engages in the power elite analysis. So he tries to show the various connections of business or government influence, sort of familial, you know, family related mm -hmm. or otherwise. And so with Rothbard, he spends a lot of time talking about his, uh, excuse me, yeah, Rothbard spends a lot of time linking Roosevelt with uh, J.P. Morgan, sort of the Morgan ambit. And so Rothbard considers Roosevelt really one of the first progressives, and he brings all these elements. He partially has sort of a a, uh, a crusading zeal. He also has a you know business cartelization zeal, et cetera. So yeah, very various historical figures around the time period are 
sort of they they're, they're putting in their proper light, I guess. Yeah. Well, it all sounds so much like the way things are today. You know, the yeah. more things change, the more they really stay the same. The book is tentatively called Roots of the Modern State, the Progressive Era. We're going to have it ready uh, at our 35th anniversary upcoming in New York this October. And, and Patrick will attend that to uh, talk about the book, perhaps give a presentation on it. We're looking forward to it very much. Uh, so stay tuned and get that book for yourself. Patrick Newman joins us. He is our uh, a, a former Mises Institute summer fellow, a PhD economist, graduate of George Mason University, and beginning a new uh, career path at Florida Southern College this fall. We're looking forward to keeping up with you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.